This is an introduction to the art and culture of Japan by Professor Rafael Chacon of the University of Montana. Japan is an island nation in off the coast of mainland Asia. Uh, it is an archipelago actually composed of four islands. That is the island of Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. It's, um, it's an interesting location uh, given its proximity to the Asian mainland and its neighbors, the Koreas, Russia, and China. And that location, of course, means that it has um, in some ways been subject to uh, that proximity to the mainland and those uh, other societies uh, to the west. Uh, it also, being an island, it also means that uh, Japan has at times in its history been an isolated country as well. It is a volcanic archipelago, a very active uh, zone. In fact, I believe a number of plates uh, coincide beneath these islands, uh, making that uh, earthquake very much a, uh, a part of life here. And the recent earthquake and, um, uh, and tsunami that struck the island uh, a few years ago is evidence of the destruction that, um, that this location has brought to these islands. That said, the, uh, the fact that it is vol a volcanic uh, landscape also means that Japan is quite fertile in terms of its uh, small uh, land mass. Uh, so a very interesting place and an important location, strategic location in, um, in the, uh, uh, off the Pacific Ocean and off the mainland of Asia. So the next two screens actually give us a sense of Japan's history in a brief uh, truncated way. Uh, so we know that the archipelago has been uh, inhabited since prehistoric times uh, as far back as the Paleolithic and Neolithic periods. Uh, the archaeology of the island, that early archaeology is less well known, uh, but it, nevertheless there's evidence of human habitation um, going far back into prehistoric uh, times. The first um, a notable civilization to emerge is uh, uh, known as the Jomon civilization, and this is named after a pottery, the cord-marked pottery of this period. Um, not much is known about the Jomon, but uh, a little bit more is known about a civilization known as the Yayoi that uh, emerges around uh, the first millennium BC. Uh, and this is the period when we begin to see the uh, contact with the mainland, that is technologies coming over from uh, China. And certainly by 100 BC, there is uh, direct and, uh, and consistent contact with uh, the Han Dynasty in China. By the year 300, um, in the Common Era, that is AD, uh, Japan has now become a centralized empire under a, uh, a divine monarch. And, uh, and Japan enters a long period in the early Middle Ages of uh, centralization and governance uh, by an imperial court. And that climaxes in the uh, 8th and in the 9th century, uh, beginning in the, uh, in the late 8th century and continuing until the 12th century in a period known as the Heian period. Um, the capital at that point was in Heian Kyo, which is modern day Kyoto. And this period represents Japan's golden age, a confluence of a uh, political stability and, um, and the development of a fabulous uh, glittering literary culture. This is indeed what the Japanese hold as their, uh, the highest moment in their development as a civilization. This is also a, a period of rich uh, blending of uh, the religion of Buddhism, which is an import to uh, to Japan from India by way of mainland China, and uh, a combination of Shinto, uh, the, the native religion of Shintoism with, um, with this uh, foreign religion of Buddhism. Uh, these two religions are syncretized uh, during this uh, Heian period. At the end of the Heian period, we have the rise of a class of mercenary soldiers known as the samurai. These were roving uh, warriors, um, in some cases protecting smaller communities, in other cases uh, ravaging and pillaging uh, these communities. Uh, and they established themselves eventually as a shogunate, um, and, uh, and the most famous which, of which is known as the Kamamura shogunate. 
uh, by the uh, 14th century, you have the rise of uh, local warlords competing with each other for power uh, in the islands. These are known as the daimyos. Uh, daimyos and, uh, and the most famous one of these is the Muromachi uh, daimyo. Uh, and they will rule from the 14th into the uh, 16th century. So a period of civil war and instability follows um, and then again another period of political centralization known as the Edo period uh, and this was actually under the uh, shogunate of the Tokugawa uh, from the 17th through the 19th uh, centuries. Uh, this is an interesting period in Japanese history on the one hand we have political stability um, under a very very strict class uh, based system uh, and, but also we have a period in which foreign, uh, foreigners are expelled, including uh, Christian missionaries. And it's a period in which Japan is closed off to the world. And only to be opened forcibly in the middle of the 19th century uh, by the American expedition of Admiral Perry. Uh, Japan is forced to open to the world and forced to trade. And subsequently the shogunate collapses and the emperor is restored. And this is a period in which, um, this initiates a period in which Japan uh, very quickly westernizes and modernizes. This is known as the Meiji period. And really the highlight of that period is, comes in the early 20th century between 1912 and 1906, uh, 1926. This is known as the Taisho period, uh, a, a period of great openness and liberal democracy for the uh, island nation. However, that seems to come to a close in the 1930s when the military uh, influences an inordinate amount of power and, uh, and begins, uh, in fact, imperialistic wars. Um, this is in, in 1931. Japan, in fact, invades Manchuria, which leads ultimately to war with, uh, with the Republic of China in 1937, and then a subsequent attack on the American uh, state of Hawaii in, uh, in 1941. Uh, this leads up to uh, a great conflict in World War II in which Japan is on the, uh, on the opposite side from the, uh, the United States and its allies. And the war concludes, of course, with the detonation of nuclear bombs in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, after that, Japan enters a period of great prosperity under a constitutional uh, monarchy. It becomes one of the world's leading economies, and that continues well into the 1990s when there was a, um, um, a system-wide collapse of economies in, in Asia. <clears throat> uh, Japan is in some ways uh, uh, bouncing back uh, slowly, but nevertheless bouncing back from that economic collapse. And it was also shaken, uh, literally shaken with the earthquake and then the subsequent tsunami which uh, devastated the, island, uh, the islands in, um, in 2011. Japan is still a major force to be reckoned with in global politics and economics, and certainly its culture, um, its cultural contributions to uh, modern civilization are uh, inestimable. So we begin by looking at um, a traditional Japanese temple, and this is a, uh, known as the Great Buddha Hall, or the Daibutsuden. Uh, of Todaiji, and this was built in the 8th century, and then it was rebuilt in the 17th century following its historic uh, plan. The temple is, in fact, evidence of, on the one hand, the distinctiveness of Japanese uh, architecture and Japanese art, and on the other hand, it's cosmopolitanism, because what we see here is, in fact, a building that owes an enormous debt, obviously, to Chinese architecture of about the same period. So there are many ideas that are, in fact, being imported here into, uh, into Japan. And it is also a Buddhist temple. And of course, Buddhism uh, comes to Japan in the 6th century. Um, but, uh, but there's also lots of attributes here that are distinctive to Japanese architecture and Japanese religion. Uh, so therefore, we see this tension that the, the building, in some ways, holds the tension between Japan's uh, cosmopolitanism and its contacts with, um, with the rest of the world at this time, uh, but also its distinctiveness. Uh, the temple is, has the largest uh, bronze statue of a certain type of Buddha. This is Buddha Vairokana. And, uh, and this, uh, this center here that we see 
was in fact a center of the Kagon school of Buddhism. Uh, this temple is the principal temple and it rules over six other temples in Japan uh, where this particular version of Buddhism is uh, indeed practiced. Um, it was here from this site that a monk by the name of Gyoki was able to reconcile uh, Shinto traditions such as the pur purification with um, the traditions of Buddhism and that was dispersed and proselytized by other monks uh, starting, starting here. So it's a very important place for the development of Buddhism as a whole, but specifically for, uh, for Japanese Buddhism. Along the same vein, we see another temple, another Buddhist temple. Uh, this is known as Ryonji Temple, or the Temple of the Dragon at Peace. And here in these two screens, you see on the left the gatehouse uh, entering the temple itself, the temple complex. And we're not going to actually focus on the temple itself, but rather on its unique rock garden, which you see down below. This temple, by the way, was built in, uh, in the 15th century, around the year 1480, um, during the Murumachi uh, period. Uh, it is a Zen temple where Zen Buddhism is practiced. And it, in fact, it is the school of Miyoshinji um, or Rinzai Zen Buddhism that is practiced here. So the monks who, uh, who worship here practice a rigorous uh, mode of self-discipline. And this, what we have here that is, that is of interest to, uh, to art historians especially, is this particular garden that we see. This is an example of the Kare Sansui garden, that is the dry rock uh, landscape garden. It's in fact a unique and, uh, and also representative example of this uh, Japanese kind of garden. What we see here is a, uh, a, a compound that has a, an enclosed courtyard with, in fact, a viewing platform that you see here on the right, this veranda, uh, or the hayo, uh, where one could actually meditate upon um, this uh, artificial landscape. The artificial landscape is a series of stones and rocks in groupings in a gravel yard surrounded by a painted wall. Um, what we have here are, in fact, uh, two groups of three, so five, five large uh, stone groupings, uh, two groups of three and two groups of two, and then surrounded by gravel, which is raked on a daily basis. Now, there's some, uh, many interpretations of what we're actually looking at. Some people have argued that this is a series of islands in a stream. Uh, there's another, meta uh, another metaphor that these are baby tigers crossing a river. And there's even an interpretation of this uh, that's based on sacred numerology. All of these theories uh, might, in fact, be true. Um, no one knows precisely what the meaning of the place is. But what it does show us is the importance of meditation, the importance of reflection in a natural context uh, in Zen Buddhism. And the other important thing is, of course, that nature is, uh, is central to, uh, to the Japanese way of life. Um, the Japanese Shinto uh, religion holds that the universe is in fact full of numinous uh, spirits, so it's an animist religion, um, that everything, including uh, inanimate objects such as rocks or plants, um, in fact possess spirit. And so one is um, invited to contemplate on those forces in nature, uh, and one is invited to reflect and meditate upon uh, uh, on our relationship to the natural world in a space like this. So the idea of, uh, of nature in a relationship to nature, no matter how artificially constructed as we see here, um, is indeed a central theme of Japanese art. But Japanese art is also revelatory about uh, the society, its, uh, its culture, its, uh, the, the significant events in that society. And so uh, an object like this, which is a very, very large painting, this is actually uh, a painting in pen and ink and pigments on a, a paper scroll, um, is in fact uh, evidence of the evolution of Japanese art uh, to include such things as, um, as current events and political events. So this is a painting from the late 13th century. Uh, so this is the Kamakura period. 
Um, and it, uh, it, it dates uh, most likely from uh, the, the, the later uh, uh, time, the later part of the, uh, of the Kamakura period. Um, and what we see here is an event that uh, took place earlier in time, some 100 years earlier. And it shows us, in fact, the rise of the samurai class. So this class of warriors from the countryside um, and their conflicts with the central court and, uh, and, uh, and their, their conflicts with, with each other. And what, uh, what this particular scroll represents is the conflict between the Minamoto and the Taira clan and their battles. And in this particular scene, what we see is rebels from the Minamoto clan attacking the Sanjo palace um, and kidnapping the emperor Go Shirakawa. So in the, uh, in the lower panel, what you see is in fact the violation of the, the, uh, the imperial uh, palace at Sanjo and the burning of that palace and then the taking of the, uh, the warriors literally taking the emperor and kidnapping him. Eventually the Minamoto uh, dis uh, destroy the Taira clan by 1185 and they will then become the rulers and this is a not just a, a remarkable document which uses both text and image to record uh, the events of the uh, the uh, or of this battle between these rival clans uh, quite vividly actually in its depiction of these events and quite naturalistically as well so Japanese art is in general known for its, uh, again, its, its allegiance to nature and its representation of nature in, uh, in, in almost a poetic fashion. Uh, so on that note, I want to show you a work of art from the 18th century, a work of art that is on the one hand functional, but also an aesthetic object. And it shows us the great uh, evolution and development of Japanese art um, in, uh, in the 18th century. And this is the Edo period, or the highlight, if you will, the golden age of Japanese civilization, particularly its uh, imperial court and its, uh, its royal traditions. This is a, a, a painted screen, a byobu, as the Japanese call it, a folding screen. It's actually two panels, um, it, uh, Two panels, side, two folding panels side by side to form a four, four part uh, folding screen. Uh, this is called uh, Red and White Plum Blossoms, and it was painted by an artist by the name of Ogata Korin uh, in the 18th century. It is a wooden screen, for the most part, um, that then ha a wooden structure that then has uh, a paper attached to it, and on that paper we have um, gold a leaf and uh, in pigment uh, actually painting it. And what we see here is in fact a, uh, an interesting concept. This is the concept of wabi-sabi, that is the idea that beauty can be found in the impermanent, the incomplete, and in the imperfect. Um, we have an image, uh, a natural scene, an image of a stream flowing in the middle with its beautiful uh, swirling currents. Um, uh, mostly abstracted, and then left and right two naturalistic treatments of two plants. On the left hand a white plum blossom tree, and on the right hand a red pl uh, plum blossom tree. Um, the stream seems to divide these two as if they were two separate entities, uh, as if they represented a kind of duality. Um, so they're both plum trees, but with different, uh, different plants. The plum trees are not perfect, and in fact, they demonstrate that they have been pruned over long periods of time. In fact, if you notice on the on the plum tree on the right, that there are areas that have been either um, either uh, uh, pruned or, in fact, broken off, and then life uh, springs forth from there. So, in some ways, this is a representation of that concept of wabi sabi that that nature itself is imperfect and sometimes incomplete. Uh, and impermanent, but still there is great beauty to be contemplated and to be found in that imperfection. And that is a, uh, a dominant theme that we will also recognize in much of Japan's uh, uh, traditional arts. That is also true in this, uh, in this image. Now this is a print, it is a woodblock print, um, so it exists in multiple copies. 
Um, and this is perhaps one of the best known uh, images from Japanese art of all time. It has become, in, in many ways, a modern icon and a representative of Japanese art. But again, the concept of wabi-sabi is here, that nature is, uh, while it's beautiful and impressive and majestic, it is also quite dangerous and quite powerful. So this is a print made by the famous uh, Japanese uh, printmaker of the early 19th century by the name of Katsushika Hokusai. And this is his, uh, his famous great wave off Kanagawa. And this comes from a, uh, a portfolio of prints which he made titled 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Now, while you might be um, led to believe that this is about a, a wave, notice that the actual subject is the view of Mount Fuji in the distance. Uh, and what we see here is, in fact, a number of navigators on two boats uh, trying to, in fact, uh, navigate a very, very rough sea. And an enormous wave, uh, almost, uh, uh, almost like a creature rising out of the water and almost certain to, uh, to wreck or destroy the boats, uh, the boats we see both in the foreground and in the distance. And an image like this also contains that idea of wabi-sabi, that in fact, that on the one hand, while nature is uh, unruly and uh, in some ways unpredictable or imperfect, that there is still great majesty and great beauty in it. We also have the sense of duality in nature. For on the one hand, we have a very, very stable land mass in the distance, the, the mountain that is eternally there, a solid feature in the Japanese uh, landscape and in the Japanese psyche. And on the, the other hand, we have a very, very powerful sea that is in fact moving almost like a, like a large monster in the foreground and certainly manifested in this great wave that we see before us. So these dualisms or these ideas are held in tension in, uh, in the work of art. These works, these prints, uh, works of art like these began to flow to the Western world uh, starting in the 18th century. And certainly by the 19th century after the opening of Japan, a great many prints um, and works of art from, uh, from Imperial Japan began to flow to the Western world. So much so that it really impacted uh, the Western world in a direct way. There is a style of art in the West, in Western Europe, in the United States, known as Japonisme, uh, which is really an art that delights in uh, Japanese art forms. And so this is a painting by the artist James Whistler called Caprice in Purple and Gold, the Golden Screen, where we see a Japanese folding screen in the distance and then a woman uh, contemplating some prints, uh, most certainly from Japan from the early 19th century. It was an outsider's view of Japan, uh, delighting in its, uh, in its textures, its colors, its aesthetics, uh, both in the clothing that the woman wears, uh, the prints that she beholds, the screen, the furnishings that surround her. There was a, almost a pan-Asian, um, um, a, a love of things pan-Asian in, uh, in Western Europe in, uh, in the 19th century after the opening of, of Japan. Here's another image. This is uh, the American Impressionist uh, Mary Cassatt's uh, work, La Toilette, or Woman Bathing from 1891 an image that owes an enormous debt to Japanese uh, printmaking. So European and American collectors uh, began to look carefully at uh, Japanese aesthetics, Japanese design, uh, Japanese themes, and above all, Japanese sense of space um, and uh, configuration in their, uh, in their works of art. And that, of course, made its way into movements like the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists in the uh, late 19th century. So Japan has, as I mentioned earlier, has had a uh, dramatic and significant influence on the arts of the West as well. And to end our conversation, I want to talk about uh, modern Japan and Japan's um, participation in contemporary art. Uh, during the Meiji period, there was a great interest among Japanese collectors and Japanese artists in all things Western. Uh, this is a period when Western art began to, um, to come to Japan and uh, be collected by uh, um, major uh, patrons in Japan. And, uh, and then Japan would join the family of Western countries 
uh, starting in the Meiji period in the late 19th century and would continue into the 20th century. Uh, this is a contemporary artist by the name of Mariko Mori, who has become a, uh, a shining star in, uh, in Japanese uh, contemporary art. Uh, this is an image of Mariko Mori in, uh, in the 1990s, uh, when she created uh, a number of different persona. Uh, and so in her, uh, and, and actually as a performance artist, she, uh, she reveled in these uh, different archetypal individuals, which show us, in fact, Japan as a, comp uh, as a modern, westernized uh, country. Um, in some ways, Mariko Mori satirizes the West and uh, satirizes Japan's uh, embrace of Western traditions. Um, but on the other hand, she also is, uh, is quite um, uh, reflective of Japan's uh, traditions of doing that and its embrace of uh, non-Japanese ideas over the centuries. This is a still from a, uh, a 3D video installation in which you can see her as a bodhisattva floating there in uh, the landscape. And this is an image called Pure Land from uh, the late 1990s, 1997. So again, it's a still from a, uh, a video uh, presentation in which we see uh, imagery that would be familiar to, uh, to any Japanese as Buddhist in origin. So the idea of a goddess or a bodhisattva, an enlightened figure uh, in a landscape. But then we have these other comical characters, which are more reflective of Japanese anime and its, uh, its contemporary cartoon culture, which is very rich in, uh, in uh, the contemporary world. Uh, this is Mariko Mori in, uh, in a most recent image, and it shows you some of the works that she is doing um, lately. So um, she um, takes full advantage of Japan's industrialization and its, uh, its modernization. And so much of her artwork today involves uh, the use of new materials and industrial materials. And she creates these beautiful forms, uh, beautiful abstract forms that not only evoke the meditative, contemplative traditions of, uh, of Japanese art and its uh, uh, traditional environments, uh, but also are an acknowledgement that Japan is indeed a fully modern, technological, uh, technologically based society. Uh, this is a recent installation in which um, viewers are invited to enter this pod-like, uh, capsule-like structure and where they can watch videos uh, created by um, Mariko Mori and are also implicated by those videos. So they become one with uh, the works of art. Her, her art lately has a kind of astral or futuristic quality to it, uh, implying uh, that um, that we will soon be inhabiting spaces like this, um, if not on planet Earth, but in other planets. Uh, on the one, while these things may in fact be quite futuristic and quite contemporary looking, they almost always uh, um, reference Japan's traditions. So for example, here's another version, another uh, pod-like structure, and yet this one has uh, direct allusions to the pagodas, the, uh, the temples, uh, of Japan's uh, Buddhist and animist uh, traditions. So on that note, we will end our introductory lecture on Japanese art and culture. <laughs>